Today is Saturday, November 2nd. You probably don't need any reminders, but the election is on Tuesday, and it's stressing people out. We already told you about a recent survey that found almost 70 percent of Americans said they feel election-related stress, and nearly 80 percent are stressed over the future of the country more generally. And media coverage of the candidates, campaigns, and supporters often makes things worse, with overwhelming, confusing, and sensationalized news flooding people's feeds every day. So what can you do about it? Today, I'm talking with Dan Harris. He worked for ABC News before an on-air panic attack sent him down a life-changing path toward meditation and mindfulness. He wound up writing a best-selling book about meditation called 10% Happier, and now he helps people find more peace and less stress through his website, danharris.com, and his Substack, which shares tips on how to live a more mindful life. Today, we talk about why the election and media landscape can be so stressful, what practical steps you can start taking right now to relieve election anxiety, and how to better handle people who don't share your political views. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday, when we sit down with a different expert or celebrity every Saturday to talk about something in the news. Don't forget to tune in every Monday through Friday for our regular episodes, where we provide all the day's news in 10 minutes. I'm Erica Mandy. It's now time for today's Special Edition Saturday. Dan Harris, thanks so much for joining us here on The Newsworthy. Thanks for having me. You and I both have kind of a unique perspective on stress caused by the news cycle. We both worked in TV news. And I know for me, it wasn't until I got out of TV news to start this show that I really realized the impact of, you know, covering tragedy in person up close every single day. And your experience was even more intense than mine. So for anyone that doesn't know, can you first just share a little bit about your experience and how you started talking about dealing with stress in the first place? I was, as you said, for many, many years, a a correspondent and anchor at ABC News. And in the early 2000s, after 9-11, I spent a lot of time in war zones. And I came home from those experiences and got depressed, although I didn't know I was depressed. And I did this incredibly dumb thing of self-medicating with recreational drugs, including cocaine, which is why when I had a panic attack on the air in 2004, I was totally surprised and I didn't link it in any way to the drugs because I wasn't high that morning. Uh, But when I went to a psychiatrist after the panic attack, he pointed out that my ambient drug use was enough to change my brain chemistry and make it more likely for me to freak out. So, yeah, that that panic attack happened in 2004, and it put me on a path that ultimately got me interested in meditation. And then I wrote a book about that called 10% Happier, which came out in 2014. And now I do this full time. I do mental health. Uh, full-time and uh, have retired from what I thought would be my forever job at ABC. And so with that perspective of news and media in your background and now being focused on mindfulness and meditation, how would you describe kind of the current media landscape and how it's changed and the impact of our media consumption on stress and anxiety? In some ways, the media landscape is really exciting in that the barriers to entry have come down. So many creators have been able to rise to prominence. Some of the downsides, aside from the the fact that, you know, it's causing some suffering in the the legacy media, is is that, you know, we've got this cacophonous environment where uh, the algorithms reward people who say the most outrageous stuff. And so the way we've incentivized people to become, um, and I love this term, conflict entrepreneurs, you know, they're, they're making money by stoking divisions. And that, I think, is really problematic. The other aspect that's pro- problematic is that in an environment where you can curate your own information, we get siloed. So if you're on the left, you are not sharing the same reality with somebody on the right. And that you know, further um, drives people into their corners. So let me ask specifically to kind of these so-called echo chambers and conflict entrepreneurs that we're all exposed to. What do we do about that specifically? Because I think that's at least one factor contributing to stress and anxiety about the election and just about the political divisiveness in our country. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are structural questions to which I don't have the answer. You know, how do we rethink our media environments as it pertains to the health of our democracy. What I do spend a lot of time thinking about is how can we as individuals navigate this landscape more sanely? And one thing that comes to mind immediately is just developing 
some better hygiene around how much time you're spending consuming the news. This is a very individual thing. We all have to kind of walk the line for ourselves between being informed citizens and being crazy people. And this is where I think meditation is super useful, not just meditation, also therapy and having good friends you can talk to. But meditation gives you this mindfulness or self-awareness that might wake you up if, you know, if you're on hour eight of doom scrolling and you're starting to tweet in all caps or whatever, that you have this practice that can let you know, oh, oh yeah, there are a bunch of signals my body is sending to me. Like, I need food. I need to go outside. I need to talk to another actual human being that, that this very powerful technology that I'm interacting with is overriding. So let's talk about the next few days leading up to November 5th. And then also what we do after November 5th, because my guess is that the news cycle and the stress around this isn't going to end on Election Day. So I mentioned a couple of techniques earlier. One is, you know, just trying to be a little bit more vigilant about how much news you're consuming. And then what I think can help with that is meditation, mindfulness meditation, which does, in my experience and, and according to the, the research, boost your self-awareness so that you're, you're not so yanked around by all of your urges and thoughts and emotions. But I think there are many other important hacks, and I'll just give you one of them. And hack may be a little, it may trivialize what I'm about to say, because I think these are, are life-changing strategies. So the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is this phrase, action absorbs anxiety. I think many of us feel incredibly helpless and hopeless as we, as we look at this election. And yet there are things we can do to restore our sense of agency. You can get involved locally on a campaign, but if you don't want to get involved in politics, you can just volunteer at an animal shelter or a soup kitchen. And if you don't have time for that, which I sympathize with, you could just be more useful in your immediate environment. I, I often ask people to run this little this little mental simulation, like what is it like when you hold the door open for somebody else? I think if you're paying attention, if you're mindful in that moment, you'll notice it feels good. And that feeling is infinitely scalable. When we do good, we feel good. And so th that is something we can ride all the way toward personal, uh, boosted personal happiness. And I think in my more optimistic moments toward, you know, salvation for the species. And do you find that to be helpful, especially for people who are skeptics about meditation, as you were when you first started? For sure. I mean, I was super skeptical about meditation. I thought it was for, you know, people who live in a yurt or, you know, really into aromatherapy or whatever. And I, I had no interest in it. But what changed my mind is all of the science around, uh, around what it can do to your brain, the rest of your body, to your psychology, to your behavior. It's very, very interesting and super compelling. And having just tried it out in my in the laboratory of my own mind for the last 15 years, I've seen really interesting results. Meditation is foundational to what I do, but I, I'm really much more interested on my podcast and in, in books that I'm writing that will come out in the future and on social media. What I'm really interested in is, is all the ways that we can learn to do life better. You know, ancient wisdom and modern science have produced all of these very actionable, practical, evidence-based mechanisms for surviving the 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 tumult of of modern life during an election or not. And so my my job is to surface all of this and let people, you know, I sometimes say I'm I'm providing a menu, not a to-do list. Pick pick from it what what works for you. Still coming up, we talk about how to have less reactive conversations with people who disagree with you and what everybody wants when they're talking politics. Plus, Dan Harris shares his advice for how to handle it if your preferred candidate loses this election. And in case you're feeling a bit inspired to be more mindful after this conversation, we're sharing a special bonus at the very end of the episode, one of Dan Harris's guided meditations to introduce you to the basics and give you a mini mindfulness break today. All that and more coming up. But first, a quick break for our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Honey Love. Before I found Honey Love, I just thought if I wanted to wear shapewear, it would have to be uncomfortable. So I would only wear it for special occasions and if I really needed to. Thanks to Honey Love, the occasion doesn't matter because Honey Love has thought of everything to make shapewear more comfortable, cute, and effective. Like their shapewear has targeted compression technology that distinguishes between areas you want more support and areas you need less compression. It's designed to work with your body, not against it. And same goes with everything else I've gotten from Honey Love, including leggings, tanks, the list goes on. It's one of the only brands where you can tell they've really thought about the things that women typically get annoyed by. 
and they fixed those issues. Honey Love has you covered for the everyday look, workouts, weddings, and more. So treat yourself to the best bras, shapewear, leggings, and more on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash newsworthy. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off at honeylove.com slash newsworthy. After your purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them, so please support our show and tell them we sent you. Say yes to every adventure with Honey Love. The Newsworthy is also brought to you by Lumen. We don't need to wait for the new year to feel our best. In fact, I think it's better to just get started now so you can learn how to manage stress, keep your energy up, and have improved overall health even through the holidays. By the time January comes around, you'll already feel like you've made progress. And Lumen can help. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored, personalized guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. This is the type of technology that used to only be available to top athletes in clinics. But now, Lumen makes lab-level metabolic testing accessible. I found the insights from my Lumen so fascinating as I realized how the food I eat affects me in all different ways. And thanks to the app's guidance, I can adjust my food choices with confidence. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash newsworthy to get 15% off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot me slash newsworthy for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. Okay, now back to our conversation. Once you've figured out the the strategy that works for you, what does that mean? You feel less anxiety to just not be as reactive when someone says something you disagree with? What's an example? Action, action absorbs anxiety, I think, is really good for just this miasmatic general sense of fear and hopelessness that a lot of people feel. It, it doesn't go directly at this issue of being overly reactive, which I think a lot of us feel. So let me give you a couple of things that will will really get at that. So if you're you're sitting around the table and you've got friends or family members who are voting for the person you don't like and you're trying to figure out how to deal with it, first of all, just to uh, shout out mindfulness meditation again, it really does help you have more distance from your thoughts so that you're not acting them out reflexively. Having said that, if you uh, th- this is what I'm about to say doesn't require meditation at all. Um, I did a story many years ago where I, I spent some time with a group called the Braver Angels, and they bring together reds and blues from across the country and, and put on these very interesting and seemingly quite successful discussions uh, or encounter sessions. And their principal rule is never try to change anybody's mind. If you're trying to convince somebody how stupid they are, it's unlikely to work. What their goal instead is accurate disagreement. And I love that. So when you're talking to somebody you disagree with, get curious. What, why do they believe what they believe? And if you can make that your goal, I think it's, it's likely to lead to better conversations. I imagine that cultivates empathy a bit more than just anger. First of all, it's what everybody wants. So if you're looking to have successful conversations, if you can bring curiosity to the table, repeat back to people what you believe you've heard. That's a technique called reflexive listening, where when somebody says something to you, you sum it up in your own words very concisely. People want, even though they may not know it, what we want on the deepest level is to be heard and understood. And if you can provide that for people, it is a massively powerful disarmament technique. And for you, it has the benefit of once you understand people and and have heard them correctly, even if you disagree with them, I find that's a much more soothing stance than reflexive hatred. What's your advice for after the election, maybe someone who their candidate did not win? How do you think they can help themselves with feelings of disappointment, anxiety, et cetera, post-election. One technique, and this is another little slogan or phrase that I love, is never worry alone. We, as a species, evolved for social interaction. There, there was a fascinating study that was done at Harvard that has been ongoing at Harvard for about 90 years, I believe. It's called the Harvard Study for Adult Development. And they've been looking at several generations of families in the Boston area and trying to figure out, like, wh- what are the variables that lead to a long and healthy life? The thing that matters the most is the quality of your relationships. Why? Because stress is generally what kills us. And the best way to regulate stress is to have quality relationships. 
Hence the expression, never worry alone. And so if you're freaking out about the election, call your mom, call your friends. Don't make this a solo endeavor. Make it a team sport. As someone who talks about this sort of thing a lot, what are you seeing in in the lead up to this election? Like what's really standing out to you about how people are handling it? You know, I, I preach the value of open mindedness. There's a lot of data to show that open mindedness or intellectual humility is really good for you. In other words, not assuming you know it all has been shown to help with all of these uh, things that we all care about, you know, our mental health, our professional success. And I can see even in myself that I'm dug in. And when I when I put myself and I do try to put myself in the situation of listening to people with whom I disagree, I'm you know physically uncomfortable. And yet it seems so important both both in terms of like being a good citizen, but also in terms of being a happy person to expose yourself to different points of view. I want to be honest that it's hard. And yet I'm worried that I don't see much of it, um, that there isn't a strong enough movement. There are good examples of this, of attempts on this, but there isn't a strong enough cultural norm around. Yeah, let me get educated on why somebody's voting for X candidate. Let me really figure that out. And I think that's just a good point in itself, that even someone who talks about, you know, managing stress and techniques to do so struggles with it. There's a reason why, you know, my book was called 10 percent happier. Like I don't think there is such a thing as a, a silver bullet. And my life is is as messy as yours. I've just I've just become a quasi expert in all of the ways that we can make it just a little bit messy, less messy, uh, just a little bit happier. I love that. Final thought or takeaway for our audience when it comes to election stress. You don't have to do all of the things I recommended. You don't have to do any of them. But if, you know, if you pick one or two, um, maybe you start to experiment with meditation or maybe you become a little bit more useful to people in your family or at work in the the name of action absorbing anxiety. Or maybe you get better at not consuming the news alone and, and, you know, reach out and, and do election night with some friends. Pick one or two of these things and, and give it a try. And the, the overarching message here is, is, I think, a hopeful one, which is we can use this difficult time as a workout, as a dojo for the rest of our lives. In other words, you can use this moment to practice skills that will help you for the rest of your life. And that, I think, is a really cool reframe. Well, thank you so much to Dan Harris for sharing his story and his menu of strategies for us to choose from to help improve our lives. Be sure to check out more of his work at danharris.com. And he's given us permission to share one of his short guided meditations with you all at the end of this episode as a special bonus. So stay tuned for that in just a moment. But a quick reminder that we here at The Newsworthy try to help you stay informed in less time and with less stress through our 10-minute daily news roundups every weekday. So be sure to join us again on Monday to get the news you need in our fast, fair, fun format. You can follow us in your favorite podcast app for free so you never miss an episode. So we will be back on Monday. But for now, let's get to Dan Harris and one of his guided meditations, introducing you to a simple mindfulness practice. And hopefully it'll help reduce some of your election-related stress. Okay, sit comfortably. That's step number one. You don't have to twist yourself into a pretzel on the floor unless you want to. I sit in a chair. You can also stand up or lie down, although if you lie down, that might lead to an unintentional nap. Whatever your position, you should keep your spine reasonably straight. You don't want to get uptight about anything in this process, actually. Step number two is to feel your breath. Let's pick one spot, your nose, your belly, or your chest. You don't have to think about the breath. What you really want to do is go beneath the level of thought and just tune into the raw data of the physical sensations of the body breathing. You also don't need to breathe in any special way. This is not a breathing exercise. Just feel the breath as it naturally occurs. If focusing on the breath makes you anxious, not a problem. Let's just pick something else to focus on so you can instead choose the feeling of your full body sitting. You can pick one spot on the body, like whatever your hands might be feeling. You can 
focus on the sounds and the environment, many options. Just pick something and commit to it for a few minutes. Step number three is the most important. Every time you get lost in thought, which you will thousands of times, just gently return to the breath. I'm going to shut up for a minute and let you try this. When you notice yourself getting carried away, it's very easy to tell yourself a whole story about how you're a failed meditator, but actually noticing the distraction, waking up from the discursive thinking is proof not of failure, but of success. Because the whole game here is to become more familiar with your inner cacophony so that it doesn't own you. All right, I'm going to go quiet again. Let's keep at it. No matter how many times you get distracted, no matter how humiliating your thoughts might be, all you have to do is blow them a kiss and go back to whatever you're focusing on, your breath, the feeling of your body. This is like a bicep curl for your brain. Okay, when you're ready, you can open your eyes, resume your day, <laughs>